Last week, we came to the end of Acts 7 and the lynching of Stephen. Now, up till now, I've not used the word lynching to refer to the death of Stephen because, frankly, I had always assumed that that word, lynch, referred specifically to hanging. Because I've only heard the word used in reference to violence against blacks, mostly in the context of the post-Civil War Reconstruction era of the South in the United States. And all of the images I've ever seen that have been captioned with the word lynching have involved the use of a noose. But according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, lynching is a form of violence in which a mob, under the pretext of administering justice without trial, executes a presumed offender, often after inflicting torture and corporal mutilation. The term lynch law refers to a self-constituted court that imposes sentence on a person without due process of law. Both terms are derived from the name of Charles Lynch, 1936 through 96, a Virginia planter and justice of the peace who during the American Revolution headed an irregular court formed to punish loyalists. Now, Charles Lynch was a Quaker. He was a pacifist and was opposed to violence, and he never ordered anybody to be executed, and he was not a racist. He was anti-slavery. He did not own any slaves, and as a jurist, he acquitted a number of black defendants who had been wrongfully accused. But he did put a number of British loyalists in prison, hold them without trial on the basis of their own testimony about their loyalties, for up to a year at a time, at which time he would grant them clemency unless and until they reoffended in some way. Nevertheless, within his lifetime, people began using his name to refer to instances where punishment was meted out without a proper trial. People would say so-and-so was tried under Lynch's law, and the appellation stuck. And before the end of the 18th century, the verb to lynch was being used in common parlance to mean to make a summary judgment without trial. So properly speaking, to lynch someone means to make judgment against them and mete out punishment without a legal trial. So Stephen was lynched because his trial wasn't legal. Yes, he was brought before the Sanhedrin, a legal body, which had the power to put people on trial, But we know from the record of Jesus' trial that the Sanhedrin did not have the authority to sentence a defendant to death. That's why Pilate had to be involved in the trial of Jesus, because the Jewish authorities could not impose capital punishment without permission from the Roman government, not even on their own people, at least not legally. Now, they did not express the same concern about the legality of putting Stephen to death as they had about putting Jesus to death. And that's probably because Stephen was killed by by mob execution and not by an executioner. And because his trial arose quickly and he was probably dead within an hour of having been taken into custody. His death was probably swept under the rug and never brought to the attention of the Roman authorities. But make no mistake about it, it was a lynching, which is why here in a few minutes when we get to Acts 8.1, where reference is made to the execution of Stephen, I and my translation don't refer to his death as an execution as though it had any legitimacy, but I refer to it as a lynching. Now, when we left off last week, we had come to the end of the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. But I want to quickly review just a couple things to bring us back up to speed for today's text. Acts 7.54 Now when they heard these things, their hearts were laid bare, and they bit at him with their teeth. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, By way of witness, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and shrieked at the top of their voices. Then they attacked him 
setting upon him as a pack. Now, as I pointed out last week, in the body of Acts 7, Stephen preaches his sermon to the Sanhedrin, and he concludes his sermon by making a direct indictment against his accusers, pointing out that they, like their fathers before them, consistently fail to hear the Holy Spirit when he speaks. And he accuses them of murder. Now, that accusation surely made them angry, at least to some degree, but frankly, as accusations go, it's actually not that extreme. I mean, we as conservative Christians are accused of murder on a daily basis. If you support Israel, then according to the world, you're a murderer. If you're pro-life or anti-abortion, then according to the world, you're a murderer. If you think that teenagers who are suffering from gender confusion and body dysmorphia should have to wait at least a week or at least until they're 18 to seek out mutilative surgery, you're a murderer. And though I don't know specifically what all the issues at the time might have been, it seems completely plausible to me that the Sanhedrin as a political body had been accused of murder lots of times if for no other reason than because they were a judicial body that had the power of life and death over the people that they tried. And they had imposed capital punishment on no small number of people. So the epithet that they had murdered an innocent defendant, though certainly unwelcome by them, had surely been laid at their feet before. So no, I don't think that that's why they stoned Stephen, even because he spoke the name of Jesus. As Stephen brings his sermon to a close, Christ refers to Jesus using obvious messianic references to him from the Old Testament, referring to him as the righteous one and as the son of man. And that's when the demons dwelling in or among the members of the Sanhedrin showed themselves. In Acts 7.54, it says that The hearts of the priests and scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees on the high council were laid bare. This means that all pretense was dropped and their true character showed through. And when that happened, they bit at Stephen with their teeth. Now, in most Bible translations there, it says that they gnashed their teeth at him. Gnashing your teeth is is an expression of internalized anger. That's not an accurate translation of the text here. What it actually says here in the original Greek is that the members of the high council brooks on at him. And according to the Liddell Scott Greek-English lexicon, the English definition Nash does not hold good for the Greek word brooks on. Rather, brooks on means to bite, to eat greedily, to gobble to champ at the bit, to tear to pieces, to devour, to gnaw on. Now, if this verb stood alone in Acts 7, the clear indication would literally bit Stephen. However, as Luke words this passage, the word brooks on is modified by the, uh, the preposition epi, which means upon, over, at, or over against. And the clear sense of what is reported to us in this verse is that these men literally bit at Stephen in the same way that wolves or dogs or other predators bite at their prey before they pounce on them. Or as it was pointed out to me after my lesson last week, the way that bears pop their teeth at their prey or at enemies before they attack. This is not an internalized stress response to a maddening accusation. This is an externalized, aggressive, and rapacious action toward prey or toward a natural enemy that has been cornered. This is animalistic, not human. Viciously biting at someone is not normal human behavior in any culture. This is demonic behavior. And that characterization is corroborated by what is recorded for us in Acts 7.54. Because when Stephen makes his specific reference to Jesus as the Son of Man, a clear messianic reference, 
the men of the high council covered their ears with their hands and shrieked at the top of their voices. Now, that is not normal human adult behavior. Now, yes, I can see a three-year-old covering his ears to keep from hearing something that he doesn't want to hear, but come on. I mean, little kids, little babies like to play peekaboo when they're very young, but children whose brains are developing at a normal pace learn object permanence by the time they're eight months old. Before your kid is one, he knows that things that are there don't go away when you cover your eyes. And it's got to be the same for covering one's ears. People know before they're able to speak that sense perception or the lack thereof does not change reality. No, the only rational reason for covering one's eyes or for covering one's ears is to prevent pain or injury. When the sun is in your eyes, you cover them because the brightness of the sunlight hurts. Same is true for loud noises. Loud noises aren't just startling, they hurt. When you anticipate a loud noise coming, you cover your ears to protect yourself because loud noises hurt. Or you might cover your eyes or your ears or plug your nose to block out poisonous smells or toxic smoke or the sight of blood or the smell of a dead body. And as I read Acts 7.57, it looks to me like something like that is happening here. Yes, I understand that blasphemy is offensive. And I understand that somebody not wanting to hear the, the Lord being blasphemed might cringe. But I can't understand a jurish, a jurist covering his ears to prevent himself from hearing evidence that would tend to convict the accused, especially if you hated the accused. No, you'd want to hear that loud and clear. So you could testify to it later if you had to. I can't imagine mentally healthy, developmentally normal human adults screaming and covering their ears to prevent themselves from hearing words being said. After all, Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, 11, it isn't what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him. Hearing blasphemy does not damn you to hell. It's speaking blasphemy that damns a person to hell. And these men have heard blasphemy stated and repeated many, many times in the court of the high council. And as far as we know, never before covered their ears or screamed in revulsion. Rather, just as any good jurist should do when damning testimony is being given, the room grows silent and everybody leans in to make sure they hear it properly. So why would the members of the Hive Council do what Acts 757 says these men did when they covered their ears and screamed at the top of their voices? Self-preservation. Mortal fear or immortal fear. Supernatural fear. Demonic terror. After all, what is it that happens in the Bible every time Jesus confronts an evil spirit? They scream and flee for their lives. That, it appears to me, is what's happening in Acts 7.57. It isn't just hatred that's motivating the behavior of the men of the Sanhedrin, but primal fear. Now, I've reiterated this for this morning's lesson because this theme, the church being confronted with direct demonic activity, continues in chapter 8 of the book of Acts. Picking up in Acts 7.58, they dragged him out of the city and began pelting him with stones, and the martyrs laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
And as they were stoning Stephen, they called out, Lord Jesus, excuse me, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And here I just want to point out the difference in the comportment of Stephen and his, and his accusers. Stephen is the one in real peril. Stephen is the one in real pain. His former friends and colleagues, his fellow priests, fellow scholars, synagogue presidents, and community leaders have all turned against him. They've turned their backs on him and have turned a theological argument literally into a federal case. They're pointing the finger at him and calling him a blasphemer, and they have swarmed him like a pack of dingoes and are snapping their teeth at him like rabid dogs. And now they're bludgeoning him to death with rocks. And they're screaming and covering their ears like they're the injured parties in this altercation. But Stephen, as far as we know, isn't screaming a bit. He's being treated like an animal, but he's the only one who's maintaining his humanity. The mob is barking like howler monkeys, but Stephen is speaking in words, and not just any words, but kind words, gentle words, words of grace. Stephen has the face of an angel. The mob is possessed by the minions of Satan himself. What a contrast. Picking up again in Acts 1, and Saul was in agreement with the lynching of Stephen. Now, this is notable and worth pointing out. The book of Acts, most scholars think, written by Luke, was written to a man named Theophilus who was going to aid in Paul's defense in his trial in Rome. The purpose of the book of Acts is as a defense document for Paul. But when it comes to Paul's behavior prior to his conversion, there are no excuses. No lies are told. His behavior is not minimized. It isn't explained away. He was 100% committed to the destruction of the church. And he was wrong. And he later admits that he was wrong. He makes no excuses for himself. Rather, he calls himself the chiefest of sinners. And I want to just ask you to think about this. What would it be like if more people had that kind of radical honesty with themselves and with others? What would it be like if politicians who had once held a certain position on an issue and later changed their mind simply said, I was wrong? I changed my mind, and here's why I changed my mind, and here's when. Paul did that. He pointed to the exact day. This happened to me. And my mind got changed for me. And when was the last time you saw a discussion, a debate, in which one of the debaters said, huh, that's a good point. Give me some time to think about that. 
I've seen it, but it's rare. Continuing on. And there arose from that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And all her members, except the apostles, were scattered abroad throughout Judea and Samaria. Now, this sounds like a terrible thing. There are two sides to this coin. This persecution and diaspora of Christians was a great tragedy, but it was also useful to God. Remember, the first commandment ever given in the Bible, the original commandment in Genesis 1.28, and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, spread out across the land. Occupy the whole earth, establishing your authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, every living creature on earth whatsoever. But then, in Genesis 11, 1 through 4, we find the following. Everyone on earth shared one universal Ur language and one universal vocabulary. As they migrated eastward, they found a valley in Shinar and settled there. They had developed the ability to bake bricks that were as good a building material as stone, and they had learned how to use raw bitumen as an effective mortar. And they said to one another, Let us bake a batch of super hard bricks and build a city with a high tower, a gate to heaven. There's no need for us to spread out across the earth. We'll make a name for ourselves right here. This is why the Lord came down, to see the city and the tower that the humans were building. And by way of witness said, look at the way these humans conspire on their schemes. This is what happens when there's no barrier keeping them in check. As long as they all share a common language, there's nothing to stop them. There's no telling what they'll try next. Very well, then, let us go down and fracture their speech so that no one will understand what his neighbor is saying. Verse 8, thus the Lord gave them no choice but to stop building and continue their migration, and he scattered them all over the earth. Well, in much the same way, in John 16, 32, at the Last Supper, Jesus said to the gathered disciples, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. But this didn't happen right away. This does not refer to the night that Jesus was betrayed, when the apostles fled for their lives. When they fled, they didn't go far, and they certainly didn't go to their own homes in Galilee. No, the prophecy of John 16.32 refers to the fact that the early church, according to Acts 2, was comprised of devout men from every nation under heaven. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, Pontusians, Asians, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Egyptians, Libyans, Cyrenians, Romans, Cretans, and Arabians. This huge and growing church in Jerusalem was made up of people from the far-flung regions of Eurasia, people from 1,500 miles in every direction. But they liked being in Jerusalem. They liked being together, and they would never have voluntarily dispersed and gone each to his own home. So God saw to it that it was done for them, that they were compelled to be scattered. Acts 8.1 is the fulfillment of John 16.32, and by this the gospel was spread and God's will was done. Moving on to Acts 8.2. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. 
But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off both men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the, to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ to them. And because of what they were hearing and the signs they were seeing, the crowds, to a person, paid close to what was saying. For unclean spirits, shrieking at the top of their voices, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was an air of elation in that city. So far, so good. But now a new character is going to be introduced into the narrative, and things take a little bit of a turn. Because, you see, the Word of God does not produce the same results in everyone who hears it. Remember the parable of the sower. In that parable, Jesus describes four types of soil. Compacted soil, rocky soil, thorny soil, and fertile soil. And in my opinion, Simon Magus, or Simon the Sorcerer, is a good example of thorny soil soil. Returning to our text, Acts 8, 9. Now there was a man named Simon who had for some time practiced magic in the city. And calling himself the Great One, he had mes mesmerized the people of Samaria. From the least to the greatest, they gave him their rapt attention, saying, this great power is of God. And they lent him their ears because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Just like the thorny soil, the word of God takes root in Simon Magus and sprouts. But its roots aren't deep and the soil isn't particularly fertile. And it isn't long before the thorns in that soil rise up and choke out the word of God. Continuing in Acts 8.14, now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. But they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But when they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money? You have no share in this. No inheritance in the word, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be, may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned with bitterness and a prisoner to evil ways. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now at this point, many of you may be quietly objecting to the fact that I have classified Simon Magus as thorny soil rather than fertile soil, because we like to see the gospel succeed, especially in unlikely places. We love those scenes in movies where the unlikely convert to whatever cause is at hand has a denouement 
and the light comes on and he changes his mind. We love the fact that in the final reel, the Grinch's heart grows three times its erstwhile diminutive size. We love that Ebenezer Scrooge wakes up and it's not too late. He can still buy the Christmas goose and save Tiny Tim. For years, that's the way I read this story in Acts 8 as a story with a happy ending. I mean, sure, Simon Magus got ahead of himself, but he has repented, and old habits die hard. After all, who can blame him for wanting the power to impart the Holy Spirit with the laying on of hands? I mean, sure, you know, he got out in front of his skis, but Peter corrected him, and he accepted his correction. Didn't he? I mean, he repented. Didn't he? Surely this was just, just a, a, a hiccup. Surely his salvation was secure in the end. I mean, we never hear from him again, and his name is never brought up again, so we don't actually know what happened to him. But Acts 8 leaves us on a hopeful note for Simon Magus, doesn't it? Well, just to be clear, I don't know the fate of Simon Magus, and neither do you, and neither does anyone else, for sure. The Bible does not give us a final disposition on him. So we do not know his salvific status when we leave him behind in Samaria. And I'm not going to make such a pronouncement today or any time about him. However, there are some good reasons for leaning toward seeing him as thorny soil for the gospel rather than as fertile soil. And I'll tell you what they are and let you think about this on your own to come to your own conclusions. First, there's the language that Peter uses when he confronts Simon because Peter doesn't just tell him that he's wrong for thinking that he could buy the gifts of God with money. He says that his error is born of the gall of bitterness and iniquity that's in his heart. And that's no small deal. In 2 Corinthians 4, 5-9, through 9, Paul says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the very glory of God, which is reflected in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, which vessels are suffused with the power of God, not of ourselves. That's why we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Well, if the heart of Simon Magus is full of gall and bitterness and iniquity, then the Shekinah glory of God would not appear to be shining in his heart. Now, this makes sense. After all, the apostles were in the midst of imparting the Holy Spirit to the Samaritans when Simon made his clumsy power grab. And it's unclear whether the Spirit had been imparted to him prior to Acts 8.19 or not. It could be that Simon never received the Spirit and was therefore unregenerate when Peter rebuked him. And Peter's language would certainly seem to indicate that very thing. After all, he didn't just accuse Simon of being full of the gall of bitterness and iniquity. He stated as a matter of record that because his heart was not right before God, Simon had no share in the Holy Spirit and no lot, no inheritance in the Word. 
And those are pretty damning words. If you take what Peter says in Acts 8, 21 at face value, then Simon was clearly not among the saved at that point in time. But all is not lost because in verse 22, Peter presents a ray of hope, directing Simon to repent of his wickedness in the hope that the Lord may forgive him of his wickedness. Now that looks like an olive branch to me. That looks like hope. That looks like mercy. That looks like grace. And that being the case, it would seem that all that would be needed for all of us to walk away from Acts 8 feeling good about Simon Magus's salvific status is an appropriate response from him. But here's the rub, at least as I read this passage. Because what Simon says in response in Acts 8, 24, sounds like repentance, sort of, but is it? I mean, if Simon were to repent of his sin, what do you think he ought to say? I mean, you think he might say something like, you know, you're right. My heart isn't right with God. I am poisoned with bitterness. I am a prisoner of my evil ways. I would like to change. Or as Isaiah says, when he encounters the holiness of the Lord in Isaiah 6, 5, woe is me. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. But that isn't what Simon says. Instead, he says, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. But what does he mean by that? You see, those words might make sense if Peter had prophesied that something bad was going to happen to Simon, or if he had made an imprecatory oath against him, or something like that, but Peter said no such thing. Peter predicted nothing. So to what is Simon referring when he says, pray for me that nothing of what you have said may happen to me? And what about these pictures that I've printed for you in your bulletins this morning? These images depicting the death of Simon Magus. Why does Simon have wings? And why is he falling to his death, like Satan falling from heaven? And while we're at it, if when Peter and John came upon Simon, they discovered that his heart was full of bitterness and gall, that he was a slave to iniquity. Then by what power was he doing the miracles he was doing? By what power was he doing the magic that he was doing in Samaria? Did God fill a man with a bitter heart with miraculous power? What does all this add up to? What's Come back next week and I'll tell you. That's my lesson for today. <clears throat> 